Uh, today our topic is to discuss the anatomy and physiology of human ear, which you have already done, but uh, we are going to um, like revise this anatomy and physiology of human ear and then like we are going to uh, discuss all the diseases related to ear in the coming lectures. And in this in this lecture, what I am going to talk about is uh, how to examine or what is the examination of ear, okay, like any conditions uh, related to ear. So, first of all, <coughs> this is like the diagram just showing the outer ear. The outer ear is it consists of the pinna, the external auditory meatus, and this is the tympanic membrane which is separating the outer ear with the middle ear. So this is the middle ear in which we had three bones, and then there is inner ear which is in the bony part of the skull. So, <clears throat> you can see a different numberings over here and they have talked about like number one is external auditory meatus, this one is the tympanic membrane. Then there is a mnemonic called as MIS, M -I -S. so M is for malleus and uh, I is for incus and S is for stapes, so M -I -S, M-I-S, and then Six number is this ligament and then there is eustachian tube which is the communication of the middle ear with the pharynx and then the number eight this one is the oval window where stapes is, is attached and uh, this one is the round window the small which you can see over here and this one is the cochlea and the nerve which is coming from uh, coming out from the cochlea is cochlear nerve and then there is semicircular canals this one three number and there is like different parts of that the utricle and the secule and then <clears throat> you can see the nerve is coming out from here which is the vestibular nerve. So together these two parts, they make vestibulocochlear nerve. And this one is the endosymphatic uh, lymphatic sac. As well as you can see uh, <coughs> the facial nerve, which is here, 17. And 18 is given to the temporal bone. 19 is given to the muscle, 20th here is given, given to the cartilages and 21 this one is the internal auditory canal of the brain. So um, to talk about like uh, the different structures of the ear, the ear can be divided into four components you know outer ear middle ear, inner ear and central auditory nervous system by function. They are talking about function. So you can see over here <coughs> the external ear they are showing you. And of course like there is a lot of names like all, almost everything have a name but it's not important to remember like all of them but some of them they are important so that you know uh, while you are taking history or when you are studying anything, of course, you must know where it is located. For example, this one is the helix. Okay. Then this area is called as the triangular fossa. And the one which is here is called as anti-helix. And then there is a tragus. You can feel your tragus easily. This part is called as conca. And this one is we call it as ear lobe. Of course, like here, like too much technical names are written. Like I, I'm telling you the easy names: helix, anti-helix, triangular fossa, tragus, ear lobe. Okay. 
and of course like uh, this is conca so see you can see like the conca they have divided into two you know uh, here and then there is scepha and then there is uh, tuberculum um, aricula fossa triang triangularis so i told you it is called as triangular fossa anti tragus okay so they like this is tragus and the cartilage which is opposite to that is called as anti tragus okay so same thing helix and the part which is opposite to that is called as like down to that and opposite to that is anti helix so like these are all the all the names right so this consists like we, together this thing is called a spina you know uh, as i told you the outer ear is uh, it consists of the spina the external auditory canal and the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane which i show you here so all these things is the part of the external ear so uh, the skin which is in the outer you can say outer one third of the external auditory canal is basically um, covered by the hairs or contain hairs as well as sebaceous and cerebellus glands okay in this part so the squamous debris from the from this part basically it is transported towards or it migrate towards the drum so and that's the reason you know the we call it a cerumen and sebum they mix together and they form the ear wax okay so of course like uh, when it comes to the uh, what you can say uh, the external auditory canal you can see over here so this one which is external auditory canal or auditory meatus you know like this one is have two parts one is the cartilaginous part and the other one is bony part so the outer one third which i'm talking about which is covered by hairs and different glands this is made up of cartilages okay this is the cartilaginous part and the inner two third this one is basically bony part okay so the bony part this one is around 1.6 cm long and the skin which is lining the in, inner two third of the auditory canal is made up of uh, is covered by thin skin so uh, and there is what you can say a uh, area over here which is very narrow or which is a very narrow part like that is called as isthmus so but why does that thing is important is because whenever there is any foreign body goes into the ear that isthmus is the place where it gets stuck or it get impacted so that's the important thing so next is this thing you know whenever we examine the ear and we do otoscopy basically what we can see is the tympanic membrane and it appears like this one okay so here you can see they are showing the landmarks of the tympanic membrane so we can see a shadow of round window and we can see a cone of light over here this car is called as pars tensa okay and uh, this is the nerve supply of the external ear okay like the pinna is supplied by greater auricular nerve c2 c3 supplies most of the medial part of the pinna then lesser c2 lesser occipital also supply auricotemporal also supply auricular branch of the vagus canal or, or, or like also supply and facial nerve also supply so uh, the external ear have a lot of or you can say extensive nerve supply 
So, uh, external auditory canal, this one is uh, supplied by auriculotemporal, auricular branch of vagus, as well as auditory canal, also receive fibers from cranial nerve 7. And tympanic membrane, anterior half of the lateral surface, auricular temporal as well as vagus, and you can say um, tympanic branch of cranial nerve ninth. Okay, so the the nerve supply is very 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 extensive. You can say of uh, of the ear. Okay, so now. The tympanic membrane, which you can see over here, uh, of course, like tympanic membrane is the one which is uh, separating the external auditory meatus with the middle ear, and it is like this oblique in position, and uh, it is around one centimeter by 0.8 centimeter. And one, well, like you can say, point to one millimeter thick as well. So this is called as pars tensa. So pars tensa makes most of the tympanic membrane. The peripheries are thick, okay, and they are attached to the fibrocartilaginous ring, which you can see over here. And the central part, it is intended inwards at the level of the tip of the malleolus okay so it is called as umbo u m b o umbo okay and whenever like and brightly we we can see the cone of light over here okay so this thing and then there is pars flaccida and it is above the lateral process of malleolus right so the thing is like the structure of the tympanic membrane. So now uh, going further, again like the details which I already told you. Okay, yes, very important thing. Uh, by the way, you can feel on the back of your pinna there is a bony projection or like the bony prominence which you can feel it is the mastoid process and it or simply it is called as the mastoid process of the temporal bone so uh, now um, what is the important thing uh, about this one is bony process is what like of course uh, this one have a lot of air cells okay and when you will study otitis media you would know the importance of this thing mastoid because there is something called as mastoiditis as well. So, uh, now comes the middle ear, right? So, the middle ear, which I show you, which is towards the medial side of the tympanic membrane, uh, there are three bones in that, the malleus, the incus, the stapes, and what are the function of these bones is simply, uh, if you can see over here, whenever the sound waves enter, the tympanic membrane vibrate, you know, so this vibration basically transmit the sound waves through these ossicles, means bones, to the inner ear, okay. And this one, like this one is connected with the pharynx by eustachian tube. Okay. So now, the important thing over here is, um, of course, like the malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane. And the stapes is attached with the inner ear. And incus is the one which is connecting these two bones. So... You can see the bones over here. Stapes is the smallest bone in the body. And its footplate inserts into the old window. You can see over here. This is stapes. 
so these are the bones you know in like in a bigger see this is trapezius so because this is in medius so this one is attached with the tympanic tympanic membrane and this one is attached with the old window so eustachian tube it's also known as the equalizer and this is the one which basically uh, connects the uh, middle ear with the pharynx right so now the middle ear is lined by a mucous membrane and it is filled with air okay now uh, the important thing about middle ear is what that uh, it have connection with the pharynx and um, as you know uh, if you will close your mouth and close your nose and try to blow your ears closed so that's because of this eustachian tube which like which is equalizing the pressures so if you will see over here this is the roof of the middle ear which is made by a thin bone called as tegmen tympani thin plate of the bone this is the floor of the middle ear and then there is the anterior wall which is also made up of bony part then there is a posterior wall which we can see over here like this one opens into the mastoid ear cells okay and then there is like the medial wall which is made up of what labyrinth okay so this so is how the things attached like the things are there and then there is a lateral wall of course that is made by tympanic membrane like as we have already discussed so now there is a muscle called a stapedius in the ear and what is the function of the stapedius as the name shows stapedius it attaches to the stapes muscle okay and what the function of this stapedius is what that whenever there is a loud sound it contracts this is called as the acoustic reflex and it changes stapes mode of vibration make it less efficient and reduce loudness perceived so you can say they are built in ear plugs whenever there is loud sound it protects you from that loud sound okay so um, wait i want to show you some photograph of the middle ear if i can found you know Okay, so then comes the inner ear, right? Now, the inner ear basically um, is also called as labyrinth. Okay, so there is the cochlea. You can see over here, cochlea. And uh, there is vestibule part, this one. So cochlea basically deals with hearing and vestibule part deals with the balance inside cochlea there are hair cells which convert the mechanical energy from sound into the electrical impulses okay so here inside there are hair cells <coughs> when the when the step is it vibrates so it moves some fluid inside this one and which generate electrical signals which is transmitted to the cochlear nerve which is taken uh, by the cochlear division of the eighth cranial nerve which is the vestibular cochlear nerve and the vestibular part of the inner ear contains the lateral this one um, lateral superior and posterior semicircular canals so they are arranged at right right angles you can see this one is right angle to this one and this one this one is right angle to this one and this one and this one is right angle to this one and this one so all of them they are set at right angles to each other okay 
and all of them they open into vestibule right so vestibule have two parts you know one is called as utricle and one is called a secule so again this one contains a fluid called as endolymph and head movement causes movement of endolymph you know and stimulate the processes okay so inside these processes you know there are membranes which are lined by uh, like different type of specialized kind of uh, membrane is there inside so whenever we had move the head you know the endolymph it moves inside these semicircular canals and it gives some impulses or electrical it generates electrical impulses which is carried by the vestibule part of the vestibular cochlear nerve okay because like again on that membrane there are hair like like projections which are there and that hair like projections can be can move when the uh, when the endolymph fluid rotates in them so uh, now guys you know there is something called as vestibulo ocular reflex vestibulo ocular reflex which basically maintains the gaze during the head movement okay like when you move your head you know your your eyes they can stay at one place so that is done by this one so and uh, also it also generate you can say conjugate eye movements like both of the eyes you know they they move in the same way so that is done by vestibulo ocular reflex so uh, now uh, what you can say uh, i talk about stapedius right yes i already talk about stapedius and uh, stapedius, stapedius is supplied by the seventh clade cranial nerve okay and uh, there is one more thing uh, which is called as tensor tympani so tensor tympani is supplied by uh, mandibular branch mandibular nerve v3 okay so uh, now guys you know one more important thing uh, which i forget to tell you um, in the middle ear sorry because we we already reached to in the middle ear you know uh, at the medial surface of the tympanic membrane you know there is a branch of the facial nerve which runs from here okay that is called as corda tympani corda tympani nerve so corda tympani nerve which is the branch of the facial nerve it passes through the middle ear okay so it carries the taste from the anterior to third of the tongue and supplies um, you can say secreto motor fibers to the sub maxillary as well as sublingual salivary glands so uh, you can see over here this one like what the what they are showing you here is like uh, uh, what's inside that bony part okay so the one which i show you before is called as bony labyrinth okay this one is called as bony labyrinth and it have the semicircular canal the vestibule and the cochlea right so uh, and then what i what i show you is uh, this one is uh, the membranous labyrinth like what's inside that you can say what's inside that so when we remove that pony part we get this thing okay when we remove the bony part we get this thing of course like this one is like inside the cochlea uh, this one is the vestibule and these are the semicircular canals okay so um so this is called as the membrane membranous labyrinth right so this is called as a cochlear duct okay then there is the utricle and secule these two okay and then there is what you can say semicircular ducts okay this one 
So now <clears throat> this one have basically the basilar membrane, which I'm, I'm going to show you now. Okay, you can see over here. Okay, like this is the location of again semicircular canals as well as you know this middle ear. Okay, the cochlea inside the bony bony place. Okay, so this thing. Okay. Uh, okay, if we cut, do a cut section of uh, what I show you now here is we if we we'll, if we'll cut that, you know, we are going to get this thing and you can see like uh, um, This is the cochlear nerve, right? Uh, so this is a scala tempani and this is the scala vestibuli okay, and uh, You can see over here There is Tectorial membrane. Now there is a vestibular membrane, which is also called as the recess membrane, and then there is a, the third duct, which is the cochlear duct, and then uh, what you can say, then there is hair cells. Okay. There are outer hair cells. There are inner hair cells. Okay, and then this is the basilar membrane. So basically, this basilar membrane, what it is doing, these are basically supporting the organs of corti. And what this reasoners or vestibular membrane is doing, it separates the scala vestibule with the cochlear duct. Okay. So uh, this is important. And uh, <clears throat> one more thing which I want to show you is uh, um, stria vascularis. You know, there is a vascular layer which basically is producing this endolymph, all of these things. So um, now, you know, <laughs> the important thing to, uh, like this is the typical hair cell, you know, how they are, see there is efferent termin uh, terminal and there is synaptic cleft and there is synaptic rib ribbon and this is the hair cell, there is cuticular plate and there is turcocilia, like the hair cells, the hair cells which are there. So like when we do a cut section, see this is the bony labyrinth and this is the membranous labyrinth and you know, this is how they are arranged, see. Uh, endolymph is flowing in that one and there is the uh, basilar membrane and there is like the reasoner's membrane or vestibular membrane and there is endolymph and vestibular all the things you know endolymph flows in this one and see the organs like the nerves are coming out from here and they collectively make together and they make like the cochlear nerve okay so uh, there are two main fluids you know which which run inside the ear uh, Sorry, this one is the middle ear. This is the inner ear, and see, like again, they are showing you the cut section: scala tympani and scala, scala vestibuli, right? And uh, again, this is the cross section. Yes, this one. This one is the pictorial. What you can say, a good diagram to show you how the things are. See, there is endolymph over here. This is called as the perilymph. Okay. So here there is perilymph, here there is perilymph, and here there is endolymph, right? These are the organ of corti. Okay, so uh, why I'm showing you this thing? Because uh, there is important things. So this one is like to sh show the muscles. Uh, see, what I'm talking about is, uh, like this is the cross section. Of course, this is the cross section. So the, the, here there is perilymph, and here there is endolymph. What is perilymph? Perilymph is basically, it's like extracellular fluid that is rich in sodium and uh, it have communication with CSF through aqueduct of cochlea which opens into the scala tampani near the round window. So um, the important thing is um, and with the other, other fluid is endolymph which, in, which fills the entire membranous labyrinth Okay, and it, the endolymph resembles intracellular fluid, which is rich in potassium ions. And uh, <clears throat> the important thing to show you here is, um, okay, we'll like uh, three main parts of the ear. Again, the same story, which we have already discussed, the outer ear, the middle ear, all the things, eustachian tube, oval tube, ossicles, ear, as well as the eardrums, 
these are the muscle stapedius as well as tense tympani okay so then there is inner ear and this is the cross section and this is the best uh, so perilymph here and here it resembles ecf and this one resembles icf endolymph right it resembles icf so this is like the outer hair cells you could say this this one is the inner hair cell and then there is tectorial membrane spiral ganglion cochlear nerve as well as the basilar fibers okay so of course like we are not discussing physiology so that's why uh, i'm just showing you the structures so uh, this is how how the things are arranged right so <clears throat> now to talk about the physiology guys uh, again what is the function of these things is like to uh, what you can say auditory pathway of course we will discuss later okay so the important thing is uh, like i will not go into too much physiology but like uh, uh, the the organs of sensing the voice the the voice is basically this one the organ of corti okay so uh, which are located on the basilar membrane okay now they have the hair cells you know the inner hair cell as well as the outer hair cells and these are the receptors for hearing basically okay and uh, it has like this one is the tectorial membrane it is made up of like very delicate fibers gelatinous delicate fibers and uh, uh, basically whenever like the uh, fluid it moves from there you know uh, there is a force which moves this membrane over this hair cells like that that's the way how the hair cells are stimulated and uh, uh, what you can say and the sounds are produced right so uh, what is the physiology of what you can say speaking or hearing sorry is simply uh, the sound waves are like uh, the one which strike to the tympanic membrane and they cause vibration okay uh, of course like which can either compress the tympanic membrane or refract the tympa tympanic membrane so what happens is uh, the the sound is collected from the external environment by the pinna pinna is behaving like a satellite you can say which is collecting the sound waves and sending it to the external auditory meatus and that sound waves basically to, uh, strike to the tympanic membrane and what happens like there is vibration of the tympanic membrane which through that bony three bones malleus incus and stapes reach the foot plate of the stapes okay and that is the one which causes pressure changes in the fluid which is inside the labyrinth which moves the basilar membrane okay this one and which stimulate the hair cells and organ or hair cells of organ of corti so uh, then these hair cells are the one which are basically converting the mechanical energy to the electrical impulses okay so that that's the important part of hearing you know how how we hear the things and uh, like and we 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 hear the thing right this is how uh, and the same thing occurs in the vestibular part guys um, in the vestibular part um, I don't know like if I have any photograph for that uh, but yes there is so uh, now uh, what happens in the vestibular system is uh, they have again uh, receptors uh, one are called as crista and one is called as macula so macula are located in utricle and saccule and crista are located over here in the semicircular canals so macula, macula are related, uh, located over here and crista are located over here and uh, see macula which is in the utricle and saccule okay so see, they have otoliths, they have a otolytic membrane, there is hair tuft, there is hair cells, supporting cells, and there are nerve fibers, okay? So see, uh, what happens like when, when our head is tilted, look. 
So due to force of gravity, the things move here and the impulses are transmitted. When the, our head will move on the opposite side, look, this thing will move on the opposite side. So yeah, that's all you can see over here. Whenever our head moves, you know, like this one uh, cupula, you know, it, it moves and it moves the hair cells, like, of course, due to the force of the gravity, right? So that's how uh, the things are or uh, the equilibrium or uh, our position of sense, sense of positions basically is transmitted, right, to uh, the vestibular part of the nerve. And uh, same thing with semicircular canals, like, you know, they are at the right angle of each other. And with each movement of the head, you know, uh, there is uh, like the move of that fluid, which is inside the semicircular canals. So semicircular canals, they, they respond to angular acceleration or deceleration. And of course, like these three canals are at right angle to each other. Okay. So... Each one of them, they can be activated by uh, different, what you can say, axis of rotation. Okay. Uh, of course, the one which is like at the horizontal position uh, is will respond maximum and there is rotation on the vertical axis. Okay. And the one which is like opposite to that, you know, it is going to catch the uh, movement of the head at the opposite direction. So uh, again, like again, uh, in the semicircular canals, again, there is um, the cells which, which sense the movement of, like by the movement of endolymph, they move as well, right? Like this, right? So that's how, how they, they are moved, right? So simply the inner ear uh, is also called as labyrinth. And uh, I told you, or about the vestibular ocular reflex as well as the auditory reflex, okay, which are there. So, uh, this is how the things are. Uh, you can see that like, the vestibular trigger and secule is related with static equilibrium and semicircular canals are related with dynamic equilibrium. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, of course, like, you know, uh, we cannot discuss all the, uh, you can say, physiology of hearing over here because uh, that that would be too much long. So, guys, the important thing after this is like, you know, uh, how we examine the ear, okay. First of all, okay, we can discuss this thing that what can be the symptoms of ear. Um, ear problems can be present with uh, multiple sy systems. Now, now one of the things uh, you must be in your mind, uh, which should be in your mind is, uh, the ear consists of three parts. Okay, so there could be diseases of external ear. There could be diseases of middle ear as well as there could be diseases of inner ear, right? And uh, whenever it comes to the middle ear, remember, facial nerve is enclosed uh, is passing through the middle ear you can say and of course like the ear problem can can be anything from pain to itching okay ear ache which is very severe we call it as otalgia okay pruritus can be there then there could be otoria otoria means what discharge from the ear there could be hearing loss, could be one of the presentation. Tinnitus, tinnitus, what is tinnitus? It is a, a ringing of the sounds, okay? Or you can say subjective sensation of the sound when there is no sound. So that is called as tinnitus. So that would be one of the presentation. Vertigo, when you have sense of uh, the environment is rotating around you, that is called as vertigo. So hearing loss, the patients can present with hearing loss. Hearing loss can be mild, can be moderate, can be severe, can be profound. We will discuss that. Uh, very important in pediatrics as well. Because whenever there is hearing loss, guys, especially in kids, if the child will not hear anything, 
of course they they do, cannot develop language because when they hear they learn tinnitus when there's subjective uh, sensation of sound with no auditory stimulus it can be one of the thing objective tinnitus is something you know when when the uh, examiner they can also hear that that sound we'll discuss that so all the things you know the patients can present with all the things right so how we examine ear now physical examination history again i discussed this thing how different patients can present pain itching deafness tinnitus what i go right how to take how to do examination okay of course like here uh, like some of the explanation is written like the deafness can be sensory neural can be different uh, conductive for example if there is wax impaction in your ear that is a type of conductive deafness right so of course like we will study that discharge could be purulent could be bloody could be watery uh, could be serous could be wax itching otalgia there are many causes tinnitus otigo could be central could be peripheral and uh, okay clinical examination starts again with inspection palpation palpation otoscopic examination microscopic examination hearing assessment other ent parts assessment and cranial nerve assessment why cranial nerve assessment i will let you know so inspection you know first of all we look at the pinna we note its shape its size we note if there is any deformity uh, sometimes we gently pull the pinna and ask if it is sore if it is painful uh, we look at the size of the meatus look at this one the size is less and here the size is normal uh, for example sometimes the size of the meatus could be very big of course like it suggests like previous mastoid surgery we notice any discharge or any change in the color of the skin okay of the pinna so of course like uh, many people they don't have the ear like over oh, next lecture is about that that like what is congenital atresia what are the causes of discharges okay so like of course like our next lecture is about the disease related to the external ear we are going to discuss them in that part right so uh, uh, after that uh, once you have examined the pinna um, then uh, we take our otoscope also called as oriscope so with the largest uh, you can say earpiece speculum that will comfortably fit in the external auditory meatus always explain the patient what you are going to do okay and uh, there is a way to hold that guys uh, i will suggest you to watch some video why because uh, uh, like uh, it should be hold in such a way like that your ulnar border of your hand should rest on the patient cheek so if the patient move the hand his head so your hand should move with the patient so when the if the patient moves and your ha your hand is resting on the patient face so of course like there is no chance like you are going to hurt him or damage his external auditory meatus okay and that will limit the trauma to the ear so now uh, you can see this diagram over here a very easy to remember you know we gently pull the pinna upwards and backwards because when we do that that basically straighten the cartilage cartilaginous part of the external auditory meatus so you can say make it easy to see the tympanic membrane and then we introduce the speculum and inspect the skin of the external auditory meatus for infection for wax for foreign body 
we look at the tympanic membrane, we should see a cone of light as the concave surface of the tympanic membrane reflects the light forward. That is called as the light reflex. And we should note that the, the tympanic membrane looks like pearly gray, translucent in appearance. That is what a normal tympanic membrane looks like. Pearly gray color. So guys, remember this thing. Pull pinna upward and backward. Okay. In adults. And if you are dealing with a pediatric or child, pull pinna downward and backward. So C. When someone is big, big or tall, you have to pull the pinna upward, make them more tall. If someone is small, you have to pick, pull the pinna downward, okay? A very easy way to remember. So you can see like wax, insect, okay? Infection, infection. So this is like how a normal tympanic membrane look like, you know, pearly gray translucent appearance. See, pearly grayish translucent appearance. Eh? This is the light reflex. So you see, this is the normal one. This is the perforated one. Look, that this one is destroyed. Okay, so like, of course, we'll discuss them in the next lecture. But they are showing you different tympanic membrane uh, states, right? So <clears throat> once you had done uh, what you can say uh, examination of the tympanic membrane then of course like um, you are going to take out the tympanic like the uh, oroscope or otoscope whatever you say and then we go for hearing assessment so here what they are showing you is a tuning fork and we do some tests called as Rennie's as well as Weber's okay so Testing hearing and vestibular function to assess the vestibular cochlear nerve. Nowadays, guys, we have something called as audiometry, okay? Which is the proper way of assessment these days, okay? But of course, we don't have audiometry everywhere. So what we can do is like we can do some sort of screening test, uh, like we do a test called as voice test or whispered voice test. What we do, we stand behind the patient and we start with our mouth about 15 centimeters from the ear. We close the other ear and we rub the triggers or sometimes we ask the patient to repeat the words which we say. For example, we say 39, so the patient will say 39 and whisper the word, don't say it loudly. Okay. And if like he can hear from 15 centimeters, then you can do the next word you can say at around your arm's length or you can say around 60 centimeters distance. Okay. And th these are the tuning force tests, you know. Uh, we use like either 512 hertz or 256 hertz fourth. And this one is the best way to check for either there is um, sensory neural hearing loss or conductive hearing loss. So the one which is he is doing here is called as Weber's test. Like in this one, we hit the tuning fork and we put it in the center of the skull and we ask the patient either he can hear it clearly, like equally in both of the ears or not. So normally it should, like the patient should hear this one equally in both of the ears, okay? Or if both of the ears will be affected, of course he will hear equally in that case as well. But whenever there is, there is, he can hear this thing better in any ear, we call it as the Weber's test is lateralized, okay? See, normally Weber is not lateralized, but in conductive deafness, Weber's is lateralized to the poor ear. So in conductive deafness, Weber test, the patient hear it better in the affected ear. If you want to remember this thing, close your ear with one finger and try to say something, you are going to hear it better in the ear you have closed or you have obstructed, right? So in that case, we said like the Weber test is lateralized, okay? So the abnormal finding is simply when it is lateralized to some part, okay? Some of the ear. 
and then we do Rennie's test. What is Rennie's test? In this one, we are comparing air conduction with bone conduction. We hit the tuning fork when it started vibrating. We put it next to the patient ear, and we ask the patient if he can again hear. If they say yes, we say okay. Tell us when you stop hearing it. When we say they say we stop hearing it, we put it on the bone. Okay. And then we can do, we will do it opposite. Like we will put it on the bone, we'll ask the patient if they can hear it. When the patient say yes, when the patient say no, I cannot stop, I, I cannot hear anymore, bring the tuning fork in front of the ear and ask if they can hear it or not. So when the ear conduction is more than bone conduction that is normal or Rennie's test is positive, okay? So if the sound is louder at the ear canal, the test is positive and the air conduction is better than the bone conduction. We write it as like this, you know, AC is greater than BC. If the sound is louder on the mastoid process, the test is negative or we can say that the bone conduction is more than air conduction or Rennie's is negative, right? So Rennie's test is negative in conductive deafness, you can see over here, okay? But there are there are some exceptions. For example, when one hair one ear has no hearing at all. Okay. So the test may be negative because sound is conducted through the skull bones to the good ear. Maybe this is one of the cases. That is called as a false negative Rennie's test. So the Weber test is more sensitive than Rennie test in unilateral conductive deafness. So a positive Rennie with a Weber referred to that deafer like weaker ear indicates like the conductor deafness is not so uh, bad like what you can say it's a mild conductive type of deafness okay we can also check the vestibular function by checking for the nystagmus like simply we uh, keep the patient we uh, put the patient like this and we put a finger and we move the finger on sides and we see how his eyes are behaving for example if the patient have uh, nystagmus in the eyes so it means like you know there is some problem with the vestibular part and there is one more positional test that is called as dix helpike a positional test like i will i will i will suggest you to to watch like a video of that okay so i will suggest you to watch this one uh, that is called as dix um, helpike uh, positional test okay Dix Halpike positional test so I, I will suggest you to watch this video so that you you must have a better better understanding what what to do right so um, now uh, what can be done is uh, um, you can say the last part of the examination of the ear is like the cran cranial nerve assessment why guys Remember, facial nerve is associated with the middle ear, right? So, uh, always examine the cranial nerves, okay? Because if the, there is some ear problems, you know, they can destroy the nerve, facial nerve especially. Or there are certain tumors like which are one very common tumor is called as acoustic schwannoma, which is a tumor of the eighth nerve and they can, they, can, they can compress the nerves which are around them and cause a cranial nerve abnormality. So, do the cranial nerve assessment. And the last thing is the investigations, guys. We can do audiometry testing. You, we can do radiographies like plain X-ray, CT scanning. Okay, uh, not just these, of course. Like if there is uh, discharge from the external ear, you can do swabs um, as well. Okay, and there are some uh, tests which are for the posture or to check the vestibular part of the or vestibular testing tests are there. One thing is called as caloric testing and one thing is called as uh, posturography. But like that, they are not done much, okay? So, thank you so much, guys, for hearing. And in the next lecture, we are going to discuss the diseases of the external ear.